Shalom, Rabbi Itzhak Levi, unveiling Torah truth on a weekly basis. Thank you for allowing us to enter into your homes. I hope that you have your Bibles and let us study Torah. This portion is called Dvarim. Some pronounce it as Devarim. We pronounce it as Dvarim, which means words, things of substance, speech, and we know that the Ten Commandments derive from this, it's Davar and Dibrot, which is, speaks of plural. We're uh, going to study from Deuteronomy chapter 1, verse 1, till 3.22. Evil also must have some godly force behind it, in order to keep its existence. Because we know that nothing can happen, nothing can be created, nothing can happen to anybody without God's permissive will. So, Moshe was the Torah giver. He was the law. He was the writer and instruct and show us the will of God from the first Adam to the last Adam. The first Adam is the earthling. The last Adam is spirit, Yeshua. So Moshe's Torah teaches us everything we need to know between those two giants, Adam who had control over the garden and Yeshua who is going to be the king of all kings. Adam was the king and the high priest of his garden, that was his domain. Yeshua is our priest today, but when he comes back, he's coming back as the king of all kings. So, this is evident that with all that the Torah had to show and to teach us, it was not able to bring us to the promised land not to that promised land, which is the land of Israel, and not ultimately to the promised land, which is God's domain. He was not able to bring us to the promised land. Man was not able to live the perfect life. Man cannot live the perfect life by the Torah. Man can only strive for perfection. As the Apostle Shaul, Paul said, work out your salvation daily with fear and trembling. Listen to his first words, this supposedly Apostle to the Gentile, what he says, with fear. The beginning of wisdom is fear. So Shaul is trying to teach us the beginning of wisdom. Wisdom. We need to fear God. The Torah was given to us to show us the perfection of God and imperfection of man. No matter how many sacrifices we offer, we will continue to sin for we are earth. We are just but dirt. One time I, I was still talking to one of my students um, and I told him that we are the sheep of the master. He got very upset. I am no dumb sheep. <clears throat> well, <clears throat> that's not what I was implying. I was implying that God chose <clears throat> Yeshua to come in the form of a sheep. <clears throat> Excuse me. Not because he's dumb, but because of obedience. He says, I always do the will of my Father who sent me. So, there's nothing wrong with us thinking of ourselves as sheep of the master if we walk in his pastures, which is Torah. So, we're going to continue to sin in this world, but the fear is don't think it's an open door for you because then Hebrews comes in there and says, Hebrews 10, 26, if you sin willingly, there remaineth no more sacrifice for your sins. So just because we know that it's going to be hard 
may be impossible to live the perfect life here on earth. That does not stop us from trying to live the good life of Torah. So, just because we are weak and the law is perfect, showing us the pure character of God. It shows our iniquity and our weaknesses. It explains why Moshe was not allowed to enter the promised land. Moshe, the lawgiver, was not allowed to enter in the land that was promised to the patriarchs Abraham, Yitzchak, and Yaakov. And Yaakov, it was ordained that Yehoshua, Joshua, who actually represents Yeshua. So we have here Yeshua, which is salvation all the time. And then we have Yehoshua, futuristic savior. And he represents Yeshua here in the form of the Joshua that we're familiar with. It's a type of Yeshua. But it was not Moshe who took him over. Because we have to be a nation refined through the fire. To remove the chaff. To remove all uncleanness. We need to be baptized in water. A form of dying and resurrection. And we need to be schooled in Torah. Two help us get into the promised land. From this explanation, we find a new revelation that is not given to many. When we look at the conditions of salvation, we find the physical manifestation with the story of Israel. First, they are slaves serving a foreign master, Paro or Pharaoh, a messenger by the name of Moshe, which means drawn out of the water. When you think of Mashiach, it has the same root word of Mashiach and Moshe, because Moshe is Moshiach. Moshe means came to draw from the water. He was part king, part slave, just as Yeshua was part God and part man. Moshe was sent to the desert to learn how to attend not his sheep, his father's sheep. We have the same picture with Yeshua. He did not have sheep of his own. It was his father's sheep and he was sent here to shepherd us. So what was his domain? He had to wrestle with wild animals, snakes, scorpions, bad neighbors. It wasn't even his flock. Yet he guarded them, fed them, quenched their thirst with water as if they were his own. He was willing to give his life for the flock that was entrusted to him. Who else do we remember have a similar experience? You got it. King David, David. He's, he did not have a flock of his own. He was, take, he was caring for his father's sheep. And when the wolf or the bear or the lion was able to come into the flock and grab one, King David left all the ones in security. And he chased the bear and the lion. And he killed them for messing around with his father's flock. That's what Yeshua is going to do for us. Yes, King David had to practice, first of all, with sheep before he was entrusted to, uh, uh, with the people of God, Israel. Moshe was, had to be practicing in the wilderness with scorpions and snakes and other forms of animals before he was entrusted with God's people. Yeshua had to come as a lamb to be part of the sheep before he could be entrusted with the kingship. After he proved himself to be loyal, faithful, and trustworthy, 
he was called up to the mountain to get instructions from God. The God I'm talking about is Yeshua. The instructions were to deliver a nation of slaves from the hands of an evil task master. All of this physical experience is to teach us about the spiritual. This is the opposite from the beginning before man was created. It began with the spirit of God moving upon the face of the earth. And later he moved into the physical as we see in Genesis Bereshit. And the spirit of Adonai moved upon the face of the deep or the face of nothingness. It follows and the spirit of Elohim said, let there be light. Followed by six working days of physical achievements. Now. If you have been seasoned in the Torah and you know some Hebrew words, you know that Elohim is plural. That it speaks of gods, not single, but more than one. In this case, Elohim speaks of, from, to our knowledge, is of two. As if to say, father and son working together as one. Again, when I bring this up, what does it remind us? It reminds us of Abraham, Abraham, and Isaac, Isaac going to sacrifice to Adonai, and specifically it says, and they walked as one. As if to think that you're looking for footsteps, you're not going to find four footsteps. You're going to find just two. That's what Echad means. So, we begin with the light, let there be light, and we end up with the last of God's creation, we speak of a woman, Chaya. She was formed at three o'clock in the afternoon, while Adam was created at, at uh, nine o'clock in the morning. Chaya, or Eve, was created at three o'clock. So the one was created at the morning oblation, the, the woman was created on the evening oblation. And that is the time Yeshua was put in the ground, was the evening oblation. He was the sacrifice. He was hung for Adam at nine. And he went to the ground at three for Chaya. Chaya means life. Now it is reserved. I mean, it's reversed, I'm sorry. Now that it is reversed. God made us physical, but in order for us to be allowed to his kingdom, flesh and blood cannot enter his kingdom. So we must revert to the spirit world. So we were given a set of perfect rules, perfect law, as if to say, this is your homework. These rules are known as the laws of God, but they were not given to Moshe when he was alone. The laws had to be given in the presence of a whole nation. We've spoken of this in the past. We have, we have, the Mormons have a, uh, uh, their guru is Smith, Joseph Smith. And he claims he was in the, world, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the woods and an angel of the Lord came and spoke to him and gave him a new Bible. Well, who are the witnesses? The Torah must, tells us we must have at least two or three. He didn't have any. He just comes and says, an angel spoke to me and said, we need a new Bible. We have on the flip side, we have a man by the name of Muhammad. Again, he claims that an angel of the Lord came and spoke to him and he says, you must write a new scroll in competition to the Torah scroll. You got witnesses? No, well, I traveled at night and there was no witnesses. Now compare this with this. We're talking about, about 3 million, maybe more people of a mixed multitude with all the Hebrews. 3 million people witnessing the same, the same story. 
repeated by each of those people. Children, men, adults, women, everyone, Jews and non-Jews, they told the same story of God speaking to the nation of Israel. How can you compare this with any religion? Yes, these, these are the laws that God gave us in the Torah. The Torah means the teacher, the, the, the guardian of mankind. They're not given just to the Jews. The Torah was given from Sinai. And what happened? Who was there? Who was around the mountain? All a nation of slaves, Hebrews and non-Hebrews. Egypt was a superpower. They went to war and they always brought people, slaves, to come and work the land. So, who do you think was the one who said, Naaseh Benishma, we will do and we will hear? Who was it? The 12 tribes of Israel? No. The whole nation, Jews and Gentiles alike as one, and they had one name. All of them had one name, Israel. So if you're thinking about, well, I'll never make it because I was not born a Jew, forget it. Forget it. No Jew will be saved just because he was born Jew. And no Gentile will perish because he's a Gentile. If Jews and Gentiles are branching of the same stock of Yeshua, the lawgiver, and they produce the same fruit, you will not know who is a Jew and who is not. Many, many Messianic uh, people today live more godly life than many Israelis. Very sad to say. So, a whole nation heard, a whole nation saw, a whole nation voiced their voice. Naase venishma, we will do and we will hear. We saw the glory of God. We received the law from God. And we as a nation, as one, replied that we are going to be doers. So who is justified? The doers are justified. Not those who just talk all the time. We have many, many preachers, teachers, rabbis, who all they do is talk. But how is their life measured? Do they teach the Torah? Or do they teach editions of the Torah from different books, man-made? I claim that all religions are abhorrent to God and they're all man-made. The Torah is different. The Torah is a prescription for a way of life, the way we can live in safety, in security, under the shadow of the Almighty. The deliverance by Moshe and the experience of 40 years was one of cleansing and purifying and teaching the nation that will be allowed to enter into the promised land. This experience is physical, but alludes to what is needed in order to enter the spirit world. For one, there is weeding out the chaff from the wheat by the Spirit. So you know how this is done. Back in the day, no machinery, no technology. Everything today is, hey, there's a handkerchief there. Oh, it's technology. So everything today is technology. Back then they didn't have that. It was just a way, a means of removing the chaff from the wheat. So what do you do? You bring the chaff with the wheat, as they are in kernels, and you thrash them, you, you, you break them. But you're not going to sit there with the tweezers removing each chaff by hand. So what do you do? You trust on God. God, we need some wind around here. So you have two or four people grabbing a hold of each of the corners of the sheet, and they throw the wheat up in the air, and the wind is able to blow away the chaff, which is lighter than the kernel. And what you have left is the kernel to make bread and others. 
So that's what's going to happen in the end. God is going to take all of us by the Spirit. Those who are the chaff are going to eternal damnation. And those that go back down to the white sheet are going to go to eternal life with God. It is the wind that separates the wheat from the chaff. The wind. So when it would be it would behoove you to learn the word ruach versus spirit. Because first of all, if you live in America and you speak English, spirit is not an English word. Not that I'm mastering English, but but I'm telling you, spirit comes from the Latin spiritus. Now, if you wanted to translate the word in English directly from the Hebrew, you will call it Ruach is wind. It is the closest thing we understand about the invisible spirit of God. So, a whole generation of the nation were wiped out. That explains that not everyone is welcome in the new land that represents the kingdom of Adonai. Then there are laws by which one must learn to live by before they are allowed in. You think that heaven is lawless? You think that anything and everything goes? No. It is the laws that guide the principles of God. The laws are the teachers. If you see your son or daughter sticking a nail in the electric socket, are you going to sit there and giggle and call your wife and say, look, look, something so funny? Or are you going to jump like you've been bit by a snake to remove the nail from his hand and say, no! And if you see him do it again, what are you going to do? Right. Correction has to come from the parents or else the child will stick the nail in the socket and will be fried to crispering. Lastly, the old that was perfection could not be kept by no one. For this reason, another was chosen. Only Yeshua. Listen, even if you live a perfect life up in the monasteries, away from civilization, and all you do from the morning you get up, you just pray, and you baptize yourself and you pray. You only eat a little bit just to survive. The fact that and the fact is you are born because of your father's seed. And that seed already has sin in it. That sin is, is passed down from father to son, from generation to generation. Only Yeshua, his father, had no sin. And Yeshua was the embodiment of the perfect law. This transition between the freeing of the Israelites from slavery is known as becoming free from the things that enslave us. What enslaves us? S-I-N, sin. After the deliverance, there must be baptism, a public confession, cleansing from the old person that is the reason God took. You don't think Israel could have gone on dry land? You don't think they could have taken the same route that Abraham, Abraham, and Jacob took to Egypt? They didn't cross the Red Sea, and yet they made it to Egypt. Why? Why Red Sea? Because it is a symbol of a nation going through the water of blood and water and coming on the other side as if coming out of the womb of darkness of slavery into the newness of light of Adonai. Yeah. After that, there is a period of learning, practicing and consequences for those who rebel. That is the punishment reserved to all people regardless of color, race, or gender. There is no favoritism with God. He is no respecter of persons. Maybe you're handsome, maybe you're athlete, and you have six-pack. God is not impressed with that. God is impressed only with one thing, and that is obedience. Nothing else will stand. 
not how much you read the Torah, not how much you memorize scripture, not how many times you pray, oh, I pray five times a day, well, good for you. What about the rest? No special privileges, no shortcomings. God's judgments are across the board equally. God is no respecter of persons. One law for the alien stranger, as for the homeborn, or the native, the same law. Now you may have heard from other rabbis that, well, the Gentiles have different sets of laws. They don't have to guard the Shabbat. They don't have to uh, eat kashrut, kasher. Well, according to scripture, I say they're wrong. Who is given these people the authority to add or subtract from the word of God. If God says the same law, it's the same law. Who are we? Who gave us the authority, the, the power to change? So this transition of purification ends with the feast of unleavened bread. In order for one, to participate, they had to be circumcised in the flesh and in the heart. Had to walk in the laws of Torah. Had to be baptized and had to confess. Many people think that baptism is a Christian thing. No. Remember, there's different forms of baptism. But when Yeshua came with his two archangels to visit Abraham after his circumcision, he was baptized by Abraham he washed their feet. So, we will do and we will hear. We must be doers before we can be justified. Then comes the famous rapture, as is known in Christendom. But the rapture in this case is not of being taken into the air out of this planet earth. No, it was the rite of passage going from the land of purification or what I call going to school and entering a promised land that is saved for those who have endured to the end. The old teacher, the perfect law of Adonai, which is Moshe, no one was able to live in the perfect law of Adonai. We needed help. A savior, anointed savior, a Mashiach, was dispatched from heaven to come and die for us, thus paying our debt to God. Time is up. Thank you so much for joining me on the study of Torah. Until next time, Shalom.